Exponential Finance, the podcast covering finance, technology and innovation, from our home in Japan and beyond. Archax is an institutional grade exchange for trading asset-backed tokens, digital securities, security tokens, etc., based in London. Founded by experts from the financial markets and backed by an accomplished advisory board, Archax offers a credible bridge between the blockchain world and the traditional investment space. The Archax team is used to working in highly regulated markets and has a deep understanding of the blockchain landscape and tokenization too, as well as a vision of how to evolve them and open up digital assets to institutions in a transparent manner. An exchange designed specifically for institutions, and built using existing, proven, resilient, scalable, high-performance exchange infrastructure, hosted in top-tier data center space, and integrated into the existing institutional trading workflow. Archax was the first digital asset exchange to obtain an FCA license and plans to launch towards the end of the first quarter in 2021. And now, please welcome Graham Rodford, co-founder and chief executive officer at Archax. Hello Graham, good morning. Morning, how are you? Good, yourself? I'm good. Think you are still in the pre-launch phase? Yeah, I mean, it feels like we've been here forever. You know, startup life, we've been raising money and trying our best to make good decisions and stay in the game because I think that's the most important thing. So we're still in pre-launch, but we've got our regulation now. The system's basically finished. We're starting to get some traction with users and with issuers. So we're heading towards a launch in March of next year. Let's hope these things always slip a little bit, but you know, we're pretty much on target at the moment, so can't be that much of a slip. There's a few third party requirements, but yeah, with launch fairly imminent, I mean, that four months is going to fly by. So we've got quite a lot of work to do. Can I imagine? You haven't been in the FCA sandbox, right? You basically went no. straight for a license? Yeah, when we met them the first time, we talked about whether we should be in the sandbox or not. And the view was that you can't really do what we're doing in the sandbox. You know, you can't kind of just do a little bit of an exchange. You have to build the whole thing on nothing. So we just decided we might as well go for the full permission. So it took a long time, but we got there. Let's go back to the origin story. How did you and your team find each other? And how did you make up your mind to pull this thing off? Before, Artax worked in hedge funds for 20 years. Most recently, the chief operating officer, chief compliance officer and partner of one called Omni Partners in London. And my two co-founders of Artax also worked at the same hedge fund, Andy, the CTO there, and Matthew, the CFO. And the three of us got really interested in crypto in about 2013. What started out as just a bit of a hobby, really, at some point we said, well, you know what, this looks like it's going to be fairly important. You know, there's going to be some big changes to financial services because of it. In 2018, we said, you know what, let's go build it. Let's go build a credible exchange that institutions can face. So really, at the heart of our tax is trying to take everything from our asset management background, understanding what institutions are looking for, what makes a, a credible counterparty, and build that into a trading venue. And we've started off not focusing on cryptocurrencies, but focusing on regulated securities. But cryptocurrencies are becoming more mainstream by the day, a bit more accessible, you know, less of a dirty word. And you're starting to see some big fund managers and banks recommending that maybe you should have a small bit of your portfolio in it. So, you know, that's kind of what we're doing is trying to create a credible venue that's adapting with this technology. You said you want to be a credible counterparty. I take this now as a key differentiator with all the other potential competitors that are out there. What makes up a credible counterparty from your 20 years hedge fund experience? You know, there's there's outright frauds where people are just looking to take your money, steal investors' funds. And that's at one extreme. And then most one level on for that, you've got companies that are running exchanges but have almost said from the start, you know what, we're not a fraud. People will use us to invest in these instruments, but actually we're going to do everything we can to avoid all of the regulatory requirements. They've positioned themselves offshore. They haven't asked for MLKYC. They don't have exchange permissions, custody permissions, whatever it may be. There's kind of that extreme. Some of those people know that you need them and are deliberately avoiding it, and some of them just don't know. You can see this in DeFi a lot. There's a lot of innovation going on, but actually... I kind of go, well, that's a bank. That's a lending platform. There's a lot of stuff that I see there. And they're going, this is the way the financial services world should be. And I'm like, well, yeah, of course. 
Of course, we'd all love it to be like that. But the reality is that you need to know who you're trading with and you are probably funding criminal activities by not performing these checks. So there's some people that know what they're doing, but there's also a level of naivety just because I think not all financial professionals, which is good in, you know, in a lot of ways, there's a, uh, you know, there's a lot of tech expertise coming in who just wouldn't know what they don't know. There's that. Um, and then beyond that, you've got the people that are then, okay, well, we know that we need to be regulated. But let's go to the smallest jurisdiction and pick the easiest regulation to get. So you'll quite often find payments permission or an e-money permission or, or one of the easier ones to get. And then they go out straight away and say, I'm regulated, but don't really make it clear exactly what they should be doing or, or they're from a, you know, I won't name any jurisdictions or from a smaller jurisdiction where they've chosen it because they're just like, well, this will be the quickest way to do it. Finally, once you get through all of those, then you're talking about controls and processes, not really running data centers that replicate themselves, maybe not having the right sign off processes internally, maybe not dealing with regulated outsourced counterparties in the right way, maybe admitting things to trading on your venue where you don't know the provenance of those assets prior to them coming on your venue. So there's a whole spectrum of things. In, in our life in asset management, sit opposite these large pension funds and banks and you know they would quiz you on how's your signatory list changed, how do you transfer assets out of this, how do you sign off your NAVs and all of these processes, they just get you thinking about, okay, controls and processes everywhere through the value chain so that's what we've really tried to do we've tried to make it so that if you're an asset manager from any hedge fund around the world and you trade on our platform and you are going through an investor questionnaire then your investor will ask you where do you trade and when you say our tax that should give them comfort that the venue that they're trading on is as legitimate as it can be in the digital asset model still the exchange and the custodian it's all mixed together where obviously in the traditional markets these are all separate and arm's length parties so it means also from your regulatory perspective you actually you have to get an exchange a multilateral trading facility and cash license and client money license and you need to fully comply with the new anti-money laundering regulation as well of course which is it's quite a handful. Yes, it is. And, you, and yeah, and you're right. Yeah, that's a business model that we had to choose, really. And the reason is that the ecosystem is not well enough developed. If we'd have just built a, an MTF, then we would have had a few problems. Firstly, most MTFs don't settle the trades on the MTFs. They go through clearing houses, CSDs, there's other counterparties involved. So we were presented with the question, well, how do we know this trade will settle? So the answer is, well, if we know how much money that they've got, then we can make sure. And it's the same as the crypto model, really, but it's not our medium to long term plan. What we want to do is we want to allow other custodians to connect and to be able to trade on our venue. And in a way, you can see how decentralization starts to play a part in that. If people connect with their wallets, are able to perform transactions, you can see a future there. But big institutions that trade, they want to be able to trade on, on leverage. They want to provide collateral. They want to have stock lending. So we're trying to think how this looks in a few years when major hedge funds start connecting, what sort of functionality do we want? At the same time, we've got a limited balance sheet, so we can't be offering credit to everyone that's out there. What's interesting, though, is that we've got an exchange, a custodian and a broker. And if you look out there, you're absolutely right. In traditional markets, they usually operate independently. But there are advantages to having them together. But just because the market hasn't really been built that way, it's, it's harder for them to be seen. But of course, when we're speaking to an issuer and they're trying to think of a way they can get to the market, if, if they go to traditional markets and try and get a listing, they have to find a custodian, find a broker, get the market listing. They can kind of come to us and say, well, look, we can hold it for all of your clients. We can provide the broker. Maybe we can provide some introduction and there's a market there you can trade on. So this kind of convenience should help drive the costs down, which hopefully makes capital markets more accessible for more people. And then on the technical side, at least from your initial press release, when you got the license in August, you're using off the shelf, very proven software for the matching engine and for compliance from Aquis. And then on the custodian side, you're using R3 and Corda. Is that the infrastructure? So yes, we're definitely working with Aquis. One of our board members is David Lester, the old number two of the London Stock Exchange. And you know, early on, his advice was matching engines. Why would you rebuild one? There's some that have been tuned to be highly performant. 
So it made sense to work with someone like Aquas. They're just around the corner from us. You know, they're good guys. They do five, six percent of all European volume. It totally made sense. And then, and then throughout our stack, we've had batterings of third party software, but a lot of them we've decided they're just not fit for purpose, you know. Not necessarily because we're doing things digital related, but just kind of this age old problem, if you like, of when you work with a third party, you're one of a number of clients in a stack of requests. Whereas when we want something done, we kind of want it done now. So like every client does. So for the most part, we're working with companies like Unbound on our custody solution, but we have to actually build the custody solution. And then from an R3 point of view, we've just started... I mean, we've been talking about how we'll do it for a long while, but now we've just started designing and building the ledger on Corda. Also, because you mentioned DeFi previously, Marketplace, the matching engine is a traditional capital markets functionality. There's nothing decentralized about that. No, nothing really. We can appreciate the vision like everyone else, you know, but we just need to get there in a measured way. So we're concentrating right now on post-trade blockchain. How do we show people their transactions on chain? How is that information shared between a network? How do we deal with privacy issue on different chains? How do we deal with different tokens on different chains? That's where our focus is right now. 10 years time, I think what will happen is you, me, whoever will turn up to places that they want to transact, connect their custody be able to transact and leave, but that will be done on a known basis. So for you to connect to our tax, we need to do AML KYC on you. There's just no getting around that. But you can see a world where we don't need to know specifically who you are, but through zero knowledge proofs or something, we just need to know that someone who is trustworthy knows who you are and that that information will be used in settlement. So I can see how over time it moves in that direction. I can see how you have DVP on chain. Right now, because matching engine is super fast, I doubt it can truly be truly be matched on chain, even though you know loads of chains say they can do hundreds of thousands of seconds, but I'd question how much that was true. Our DLT usage, we're kind of aspiring higher, but we're going to take it easy. Cramming DLT into our system is not going to help us. In fact, it introduces a lot of complexity. And we always have to remember what we're trying to do is open capital markets for companies and allow more people to trade. And if we create something that's so clunky, people can't access it, there's just no point. I mean, the benefit by using proven matching engine and then the connectivity that comes with this is that institutional traders that you're targeting are familiar with the APIs, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think definitely got that bit right. And obviously, you know, we've got our tech issues like everyone, but hopefully when it's running and working, It'll be easy to connect to, it'll be fast, it'll be a familiar experience to people in the traditional world. The bigger challenge is probably how do you build liquidity in a new market of esoteric assets? That's the big challenge and that's the one that I constantly think about. Because we're bringing liquidity to illiquid assets and we're going to increase liquidity, but that doesn't mean there will be deep liquidity. It just means it will be a bit better than it was before. And so the challenge is how do we bring users, you know, in volume to come and trade some of these assets? And some of these assets are really interesting, but there are interesting assets on junior markets around the world that get no liquidity. So it's going to be a tricky balancing act. The big difference between being tradable in the first place, which is a good thing, but then actually having the deep market that allows for the exchange of these assets. And exactly. I think that people always mix it up a bit where they're saying they're just tokenizing. It doesn't create market depth that actually makes the asset move around. No, exactly. It facilitates liquidity. So if you've got a landmark building that gets sold between sovereign wealth funds once every seven years, if I tokenized it and trade it on Archax, it will trade more than once every seven years. It will be more liquid, but it's not going to trade 10,000 times a second 24-7. It's just not going to do that. So working out the best way to structure a market to bring that liquidity together, also trying to enable Archax to raise money, you know, and also trying to deal with global regulations of digital securities is quite tricky. I think it's all possible, but it's difficult. If you look at crypto, there's over 10,000 coins, I'm certain of it now. But outside the top five or six, there's hardly anything. Bitcoin, Ethereum, obviously, then it rapidly drops away. And part of the reason why they're so widely traded, they're traded on many different exchanges and there's arbitrage funds sitting all over the place. The second there's move adding to the volume, there's not as much regulation around the trading. So it, it's hard to create assets that have volumes of trading. 
So we need to think of ways that people will trade them on our checks. And one of the easiest ways is organically. And what we mean by that is have one or two reasons for people to come to the venue. So we're going to be creating much like the Bitcoin um, exchange traded products that are out there right now. Our checks is going to be building our own suite of funds that we launch on our venue. So people will hopefully come and go, okay, I can get access to Bitcoin in a regulated way, or I can get access to a basket of crypto in a regulated way. And when they're on the venue, they might say, oh, look, there's a UK credit union raising money and paying 12% on a bond. That's interesting. I'll participate in that. Or there's a Norwegian neobank. That looks interesting. So bring people to the venue, and then hopefully there'll be some things for them to look at. And, and it's not going to create deep, deep liquidity, but at least you know having people there means there's a chance they'll trade them. What are their public offering requirements? What do they need to file? And is are there quarterly filing requirements and as well as for the regular security markets? Or how does this work? There's a few things that we need to do. So we need to do due diligence on everyone that comes to our venue. But we don't really get to choose whether someone can approach us or not. So it's non-discriminatory. So any company that comes to us, really, we have to consider can be accessed on our venue. Obviously, you can completely rule out anything that's a fraud. But beyond that, it's not really our job to say, do we like this? Is it interesting? We just need to be able to say everything on our venue is credible. We need to have some interesting products on our venue. But almost by definition, the companies that come to us have tried to raise money in other ways before. And you know, when someone comes to digital securities, they're looking for new ways to raise money. So we just have to be careful of those companies. So we've got the due diligence requirements up front, and then we've got the ongoing requirements. And because of the type of market that we are in Europe, we get to set our own rules to some extent within a framework. You know, I could summarize them as we have to make sure that companies provide all information that an investor would reasonably need to make an investment decision. And that will include typical transparency points around transactions by executive <clears throat> or insiders, insider trading lists, providing financials on a semi-annual basis. If you're a fund or another company that has some sorts of valuation metrics, you need to be providing those to the venue for people to make an informed investment decision of the value of the underlying assets. They're all pretty straightforward. The advantage that we have for SMEs especially is that if you look at the main markets, in the UK, there's something called the official list. And when you get listed, you get put onto this official list. And you get on the official list by passing all of the rules and, uh, and all of the tests. And there are a lot there. And that's what you'd need to do for a main market listing. If you're an SME, there's no way that you can go through all that. Well, maybe you can, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. We just present a credible alternative to a company that's sitting there at the moment and going, okay, well, a main market listing's too extreme. It's a big drain on my resources if we have to go through that full process. But also, The kind of friends and family crowdfunding angle doesn't really work for us either. So we're hopefully going to operate in that space in between where, you, you know, it's a bit too big for crowdfunding and a bit too small for main market. We're not focused right now on the primary market, though. We're very much on the secondary right now. But a lot of the issuers coming to us are saying, look, can we list on your market? We're going to do a token sale. And we say, yeah, great. How much have you raised? And quite often the answer is zero. Can you help us? So we're going to start looking into that space because the liquidity problems that we've talked about are going to exist. I don't want anyone out there to think we're going around saying there's going to be tons of liquidity on our venue from day one because there's just not, but we're going to hopefully build it. And if you want to sell your position, there's a market where you can go and put it and hopefully someone will buy it. Um, but where we can really make a difference to a lot of these SMEs, especially in the current environment, is helping them raise money. We're in a pretty rubbish global situation right now probably feeling that worse than anyone are SMEs. In the UK, they're responsible for a ridiculous number of the people that are employed. I think it's well over 60% of the, of the people in the UK are employed by them. Giving them a viable alternative to a main market listing or friends and family hopefully can actually help the economy a little bit. The banks are supposed to be helping. And it's great that the government get frustrated with their behaviors. But it's really difficult because if you're a bank, you need to make money as well. You've got your own capital constraints. And as a bank, you can go under if you worsen your lending criteria. Private markets can behave a lot more flexibly, I think. Not that banks couldn't do it, but private markets can do it faster. If you're an SME and you go to a bank, they can give you a yes or a no, or they can give you a rate that's completely unsuitable. You know, you're in a tricky situation. Do you take the rate and potentially get in more trouble? Whereas if you can go to a private market, <clears throat> you can say, okay, here's my business. These are the risks. Some private investors, a lot of whom are very sophisticated, can go, okay, 
well, I'm in a basket of 10 company like yours. So, you know, I know the price for that and I can hedge my risk here. And hopefully it makes it more competitive for the company to be able to potentially get money from several different sources rather than one or two. And out there as well, you know, despite all of the issues that are going on, there's also a huge population of, of investors that are searching for yield. You know, interest rates have totally evaporated. I mean, markets have been doing well, but I'm not sure that's going to continue. And if you have a private market where SMEs present new credible alternatives or diversification away from main market listings, and you've got some liquidity with places like Artax exist, maybe they become a good place for those investors to house their investments. So as a retail investor, I would go through your broker to the exchange or would I actually through an app go directly on the exchange? So at the moment, we're professional plus, so we're not facing retail directly. And we're going to look at whether retail can face us directly in the future. But right now, to access retail, it's better that we face brokers in each jurisdiction and then those brokers face retail. We obviously support the brokers, but if someone wants to reduce the number of intermediaries, we'd rather they're able to come straight to us. One of the most ridiculous situations in the world is that retail investors are supposed to be protected. And, and it seems the best way that that happens is you go to your local broker who adds a fee on and a spread, who then uses a domestic broker wherever your position is. And if it's in another currency, you're probably paying another three, four percent spread there, you know, way above what a professional investor gets. So great, you've got all these layers of protection, but you're probably four percent offside before the transactions even happen. Getting people near the market, as long as they're sophisticated, as long as they understand the investment opportunity, as long as all the risks are presented to them. Like crypto markets have shown us that people are willing to speculate with their money. There's a whole new breed of investment professionals that maybe some of them are, some of them aren't, that have come out of this, who have taken who are taking the time to go and study digital assets, understand how they work, understand the technology, understand the potential. And once they've done all that, they for sure should be able to invest in these opportunities. The other thing that seems to be maturing a little bit is the derivative side of the fans. Clearly in the traditional markets, the derivatives markets are manifold of what the cash market is. And especially for institutional investors with your background, that's a must have and a very essential piece of the maturing of the industry. Is that somewhere in your roadmap as well? Yes, is the answer. The good thing about derivatives is basically they're always regulated. So even though crypto itself may not be regulated, a derivative of crypto tends to be in most jurisdictions. So you can offer exposure to crypto and traditional assets in, you know, in a regulated way through the use of derivatives. It's just a question of um, capacity for us, to be frank. You know, we've been working on this. You know, there's a lot of learning to be done. There's probably easier, quicker money to be made in derivatives, if I'm honest. There's already some volumes there, but we've come at it from a slightly different angle. But we'll be adding derivatives in the future. And again, you know, we need a reason for people to come to our venue. So if people can trade regulated derivatives on an FCA regulated MTF, I think that's pretty compelling. There's already one in the UK, crypto facilities doing OK. There's a bunch of other people doing crypto derivatives offshore, unregulated, unregulated from any large jurisdiction point of view that may be a marketing into different jurisdictions. You know, and I think what you'll see over the next year or two is regulators are starting to catch up now. They're starting to build lists of all of those that are operating that should have had licenses. And in some cases, we'll see fines. In some cases, we'll see cease and desists. In other cases, they'll work with the regulators to get the appropriate license in place. So you'll see this shift in landscape. And the way that we've done it is to try and come at it the right way at all times. So I think hopefully we can stay in the game. And if we do, I think institutions will appreciate it. Our tax has been trying to get the license in advance of operating rather than the other way around. You beat the Gemini twins by a D. Yeah, yeah, no, ex yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I mean, fair play to them. Uh, you know, they must have uh, started on that pretty early. I mean, Gemini are interesting because they don't have the prominence of other crypto exchanges. They're obviously a big name in the space still, but they're not one of the biggest names. But where they differ to the others is that I think they've tried to do everything credibly. You can kind of see it in the way that they operate. Um, I remember two and a bit years ago, looking at their offering, looking at how they were structuring it looking at how they were concentrating on institutional access and, and, and security. So, you know, very much when we look at businesses that we think do it the right way, they're the right ones. And I think the fact that they applied for the AMLD5 crypto asset designation in the UK, the fact that they did that early shows good regulatory analysis on their part and also shows they're trying to do the right thing. And you can't really blame them that they were beaten by us. 
So from a personal perspective, the other press release that got me some excitement was your agreement with Algorand. So personally, I must say, I'm, I'm at this point, unfortunately, probably a bit overweight Algorand. I have a few too many of those than I should. So any positive news in that regard is very much welcome. It sounded from the press <clears throat> release a bit more exotic in terms yeah. of the products that you're targeting in that joint agreement. We've got two partnerships, really. We've got R3's Corda and Algorand. And the distinction, if we talk from a personal point of view, this goes for myself and the senior team at Archax. We're all regulated individuals that want to do things the right way, but we also want to make sure that we can be a bit different as well. So the way that we think about it is Corda, private, permissioned, institutional, post-trade, that's that. But then when we start talking about, okay, let's build some funky products and think, how do we appeal to the, the kind of the decentralized world? How do we start building exciting things on chain? Then, then we started talking to Algorand and we probably could build them on Corda as well. But Algorand have invested in us and, and we met the team there. And the first conversation we had, and we've met a lot of protocols, blockchains, foundations, whatever you want to call them. We've met a lot of them. And the first conversation we had was really stimulating and it was a good argument about whether DVP delivery versus payment was possible on chain. So it kind of started there. You know, we met with their head of business development, uh, a lot of the senior team, and we just continued to have good conversations and we started exploring things we could launch. There's three main projects. One is that we're going to launch some hedge fund like vehicles on Algorand that will trade on Archax. So we're trying to bring alternative investments to the masses. We're going to build those tokens on Algorand. And the true value of the smart contracts isn't really apparent for the first 12 months, 18 months. But over time, when we talk about this world where every investment is transferable, that's when it becomes compelling. And that's when Algorand starts to receive network fees, hopefully. And the second one is we're building a range of stable coins. Uh, you know, we haven't actually talked about this anywhere. So this is probably a bit of a first, but we are going to build a range of stable coins that we can use on our venue and that follow all of the regulatory requirements in a more strict way than anything does out there right now. So ours will be more suitable for banks to make payments. And we talked about being a regulated custodian earlier. We're a regulated cash custodian as well. So we can carry the reserve that sits behind these currencies and have it fully audited at an FCA regulated venue. So that's pretty credible. And again, that'll be an Algorand. So in the future, when you have DVP on chain, when you start paying corporate actions, we'll do that with our Algorand backed stablecoin or e-money. The third one is we're exploring some DeFi elements. How do we, you know, how do we do things like you see in Celsius, Compound, Aave? How do you do those sorts of things on chain in a regulated way? And we're starting to do that as well with Algorand. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to give anyone any investment advice, but we're working on some pretty good stuff there. Some of it hopefully will come off. Some of it may not. Some of it will be value down the line. But they're, they're a credible team and they're concentrating on how do we how do we build future value for this rather than let's just do every project we can? And I think that's a, I think that's um, a really good place to be. That's where we said we have limited funds actually is a good thing because that drives innovation. And having been in that space for a long time as well, like the whole asset servicing question is a mess and the traditional industry hasn't really resolved this. So if you can actually get these programmable securities that have dividend payment, interest payments all programmed in, and that goes out automatically. You don't need any staff to do that, really. I mean, you've, you've got the voluntary side of it, which even that is probably much easier done with the right technology platform. Yeah, exactly. Whilst I think this is happening faster, and you know, you're starting to see central bank digital currencies, for example, you know, weren't really talked about a year ago, then suddenly Libra was announced, and we've had the virus and, and everyone's talking about them, you know, there's some stuff that's moving fast, but there's some stuff that people talk about conceptually, that's really important you know, like voting and dividend payments. And when we were in our hedge fund, an event-driven hedge fund, you quite often need to vote on corporate actions. And if you were voting through your prime broker or your broker, and, and then there was another domestic broker, you wouldn't be able to vote right up until the deadline because everyone introduces this slippage. So if you're an investor, you want to wait until the last moment, really, to get as much information as possible before you make a decision. 
And you can much more easily do that with on-chain voting, for example. You know, if I'm literally able to go into my security and vote one second before the deadline, that's much easier than having to go through three banks, everyone knowing how I'm voting and never really knowing for sure my vote was carried out in the right way. You know, there's not enough time in the world and, and Artex doesn't have enough money, but there's so much stuff that I think can change financial services and make it more accessible to everyone. One of the things I would love is better rewards for longer term shareholders. And also, if you have it all in the wallets, it's much easier to verify. Even if the small investors, if they hold on to the stock rather than flipping it every day on Robin Hood or so, if they hold it for a year, you get some yeah. bonus, dividend or whatever it might be. And it's definitely possible. And as smart contracts develop, you can build it into the smart contracts, you know, in the same way you could, you've got kind of accumulation share classes right now, whereas rather than paying the dividend you accumulate, you can see in the future that it might be that you get a bonus number of shares if you hold on for a certain period of time. Obviously, as an exchange, that doesn't really help my liquidity, but it's an exciting concept. So you've got a very tight deadline, four months of hard work ahead of you never going to be as perfect as I want. We've got so many ideas of what we want to do. But you know, what's important is having something, we want people to be able to sign up. So we want issuers to be able to come to our platform. You know, we want a base that we can start expanding from with the system as part of our FCA application was fully audited. That was a good exercise to go through. And subsequent to that, we actually decided to change a bit of our system. So, you know, that's a lot of the tech lift right now. So we need to go through a mini audit process again before we launch the market, but we'll end up with something more scalable and that we own more of the IP on, which will be useful. But, you know, we need to get these issuers on board. It's going to be hard. There's a lot of people may look at other digital exchanges, you know, like open finance networks who are in the US who didn't get that much liquidity and T0 at the start only had a couple of listings and people are quick to criticize, but it's not easy. And it's not as easy as it is to spin up a cryptocurrency venue because the regulatory aspects there are much lower. You know, everything that trades in our venue needs to go under scrutiny. There needs to be admissions document. There needs to be legal opinions. They need to be registered in the Crest trading system. They need to be transferable. You know, and we're doing all of this and trying to maintain a digital bit alongside it. So super interesting. The most interesting thing I've ever done by a country mile, but it's, success is not, is not guaranteed, but we're doing everything we can to increase that probability. Wishing you best of luck. I'd certainly follow it. And if I can get access there somewhere through a broker, I'll, I will try it out when you launch. Individuals can go through an assessment process on our site to be elected professionals and they can get access in that way. People that think they're elected professionals are welcome to go to our tax and register and, um, you know, hopefully that they'll be able to trade there in the future. Cool. Yeah, we spread the word. Great Thanks. stuff. Thanks very much.